All right. Good afternoon. Welcome to the January uh, version of the Austin Woods and Waters Club. Uh, we typically meet uh, in person, but uh, due to coronavirus, we are doing virtual uh, programs until uh, it's safe enough to, to meet again in person. I'm Spencer Collins. I'm the club president here. And um, my term is winding down. We've got a new slate of officers coming in in February, but I've got Jimmy Kane uh, on the screen as well. Jimmy's our club secretary and speaker's chairman. And so uh, while we wait for folks to come into the broadcast here as they're filing in, uh, Jimmy and I are going to chat a little bit about what we like to do as a club. We're a social club. We like to get together uh, once a month and talk about hunting and fishing. And then uh, we go out in between those meetings and hunt and fish and you come back the next month and talk about our hunting and fishing stories. So uh, anyway. Um, and and the lies that go with them. Yeah. And the lies that goes with them. So yes. Uh, all right, Jimmy, here we are in my presence message in the game bag. We have a monthly newsletter called the game bag. And um, uh, in my presence message, which I'm sure you read, Jimmy. I did. In fact, I was going to comment that you did duck hunting, fishing, and dove hunting all in one day. I don't know what else you could do. That, that was uh, pretty spectacular. And you were successful in all three? Yes, um, at some level of success. So we shot a, this was several years ago, maybe 10 years ago at this point. Okay. I'll go ahead and share this, this story. This is a good one. Um, that uh, I've got a little house cabin down on the Laguna Madre in Corpus Christi. And so I spent a bunch of time there and we're heading down there this weekend. Uh, and uh, anyway, I was down there with a buddy and we had some duck blinds. We got out in the duck blind one day and shot a limited ducks on a beautiful morning. Uh, and the limit's not much. It's the two redheads. And we did take a, a pintail uh, that morning each. So we had six ducks uh, total. Uh, and so uh, anyway, we, we were planning on fishing, uh, in which is pretty common, a, a blasting cast. And so we were talking about it as we were winding down our hunt. And I have a couple of mini buddies in Corpus Christi, some of which have access to land for for uh, dove hunting. So I called up one of them and it was in the second split of the season as we are in now. And I said, hey, man, how's your dove lease doing? And he says, it's doing pretty good. I'm going today. You want to go? I said, yeah, we want to go. So we went out and uh, after the duck hunting, got things cleaned up and went out, caught a few speckled trout in front of the house uh, on the boat, a few drifts, and then went to uh, clean those trout and uh, uh, loaded up the truck and went and shot some dove that afternoon. It was probably Man. five or six, six dove each, but that was a blast cast and blast. So what a day, huh? What a day. I, I self-proclaimed myself as the ultimate Texas outdoorsman. I, I agree. I, I was extremely impressed. Extremely impressed. Yeah. Well, that's nice that you have those, you know, the places to go. And that that's a big part of what the club helps with is, you know, when I came here from New Orleans, I didn't have anywhere to go. And the club, you know, has the hunts and fishing trips lined up and it makes it easy to kind of take advantage of some of that. So that's one of the reasons that I've joined the club and, and been able to take my boys, you know, duck hunting and stuff like that, um, where normally I, I would be shut out but being over here, not where I'm. I'm actually from so yeah we're going to have a bunch of fishing trips here this year i'm in stepping down as club president here next month and uh be handling all the fishing from henceforth uh, or at least the, this year 2021 i've got uh, a few uh trips in the works uh one of it well one of it which has been released we've got a a trip to baffin bay and uh captain sally's who is our november speaker uh she's got the baffin Bay Rod and Gun Club. And so we're going to go down there in April. And, uh, you know, if there was ever time to catch a trophy trout, Jimmy, it's in the spring on the new moon. And so I reached out there and reserved those dates for, uh, you know, the day before the new moon and the day of the new moon. And um, you know, hopefully the wind, one thing you can't control is the, the wind uh, there. And it's pretty windy in April in Corpus Christi on Baffin Bay, but we're going to give it a try there. So, Excellent. Um, if you want to go try to catch a trophy trout, speckled trout, 10 pound trout, 28 inch trout, uh, let's do it. Come join us uh, in uh, April for uh, a trip down to the Baffin Bay Rod and Gun Club. And so we've got our, our guest speaker today, Tim Birdsong. He's a 
he's a, he's going to talk to us about fishing rivers, not salt water. But uh, when he comes in, uh, we'll have some salt water, excuse me, some freshwater fishing as well uh, this year. And uh, we were chatting before coming on to the broadcast here about some places and, and some guides to use and such. So anyway, looks like we've got a fair number of folks on. And so let's quit the chit chat, roll into our program here and then um, we'll get uh, Tim on to talk to us about Texas rivers and conservation of Guadalupe bass and, and, and other things. So welcome again. I'm Spence Collins. I'm the Austin Woods and Waters Club president uh, uh, with my term ending. This will be, I think, um, I guess in February my term ends. So uh, anyway, thank you for joining us today. We normally meet at the Ben-Hur Shrine Temple, which is off Rockwood Lane, off Anderson Lane in North Austin, off Mopac. And um, obviously due to the pandemic, we've had to go virtual here. So uh, I would see another three or four months uh, of virtual uh, and then hopefully people will have the vaccine and we can start meeting together. But as I mentioned earlier, if you haven't uh, uh, was uh, not on a little bit earlier, but we're a social club. We like to hunt and fish and talk about it. It's in our bylaws like that. And so uh, in between our monthly luncheons where we have some of the best speakers and uh, you know, and come and, and talk to us. Uh, we go out and hunt and fish, whether it be club trips or our own individual trips and get back the next month and uh, talk about those um, fishing trips and hunting trips for that matter. We're in the thick of hunting season right now. So uh, anyway, uh, I want to uh, mention our going into a few club uh, announcements right now. I want to mention we have some corporate sponsors uh, uh, in our Austin Woods and Waters Club, we created uh, some of our forefathers here, uh, created a, a foundation. It's called the McBride's Foundation. We named that after uh, the McBride's family that's done so much for the outdoor industry here. They're at 30th and North Lamar. And so that foundation raises money and gives back grants each year to those that uh, groups that apply for those grants. Uh, we We'll ask them to have um, those funds go towards getting the youth of Texas into the outdoors. And so uh, we normally have a, a banquet this year. Of course, it was last year in 2019, excuse me, 2020. It was canceled. It's usually in October. And so we had a little bit of fundraiser to uh, raise some money for the club. But that foundation is there again to um, uh, get uh, our youth of Texas in, into the outdoors. And so we have corporate sponsors at that banquet. And I need to mention those corporate sponsors. They're a big part of our club and, and the foundation and makes it all run. So uh, first and foremost, as I mentioned, McBride's Guns at 30th and North Lamar, where the hunt begins. Uh, they've been doing gangbuster business, of course, with all the gun sales and, and stuff like that. Go see uh, Joe and, and, and the rest of the McBride's gangs there. We also have Independence Title. They've been with us a number of years. We thank uh, Jennifer and Colin for their continued sponsorship. I'm uh, pretty sure Colin would be listening today. He normally is. Uh, I'll also thank Texas Disposal Systems. We have our event at their uh, banquet facility out there in Creedmoor, Texas. And, uh, you know, they built a fantastic uh, banquet hall out there that they give to charities and, and nonprofits around uh, the Austin area. And they help uh, these charities and nonprofits raise a lot of money. We, we thank Texas Disposal Systems for all they do for the, for the outdoor industry and, and for that matter, for the nonprofits of, of Austin. Uh, Plains Capital Bank has been with us uh, a number of years for a long time. We love Plains Capital Bank. Thank you. Uh, Morgan Stanley is Rhett Stone and, and John Dayton. They do wealth management. Thank you for your continued sponsorship. Uh, Dynamic Systems, they're mechanical contractors. We, we love having them on board. Hopefully their sponsorship will, will, will continue in, in years to come. Uh, we have also Per Sterling. They also do wealth management. Uh, a couple of our few handful of our uh, club members uh, work at Per Sterling. And so we're thankful for them uh, for all they do to the club. And, and if you need some wealth management, reach out to Richard uh, Hallam uh, on that. Uh, and lastly, we want to thank Representative John Sirier. He's a sponsor. He's uh, House District 17, which is Caldwell County, Gonzales, Bastrop County area. Uh, and uh, he's a club member uh, as well. And so uh, John is a, a corporate sponsor. Thank you, John. And he's probably pretty busy. I know he was uh, before the new speaker was appointed uh, under Dennis Bonham. He was head of the CRT, Cultural Resources and Tourism. 
and then also was part uh, as chair of the Sunset Commission as well. And um, uh, love having John as a member there. Thanks, John. Okay, moving in. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to have a meeting uh, just for uh, the uh, for really two things. One, to approve a new slate of officers and board members. That's going to be two weeks uh, from today. So if today's the sixth plus fourteen, the twentieth, it'll be evening December. Excuse me, January twentieth. Uh, around 6 or 7 p.m. We're going to be sending out some information, putting it on the website, sending out some emails. We need y'all, uh, if you're a club member, to join in and vote. The membership has to vote on the new, per, as per our bylaws, has to uh, uh, vote for the officers and the board members. And so we're going to have a Zoom meeting. You'll get a Zoom link uh, for that. We ask that you uh, join us and we're going to take a, a little bit of time for club business to get those officers and board members approved for this coming year. But we're also going to do what we like to do. This format, this venue, this medium that we have here, which is our Facebook Live and YouTube Live, we can't really uh, interact and talk about hunting and fishing like we want to, like to. And so in the in the Zoom deal call here in a couple of weeks, you know, have a hunting and fishing story ready to tell. We're going to have, uh, you know, uh, a, a format where we can talk about hunting and fishing. So uh, be prepared for that and please join us. We do need a quorum. We have to have 10% of our membership in order to approve these uh, officers and board members. So I think we'll be able to obtain that and um, uh, ask for you to participate in that. Um, what else? Oh, membership time, mostly membership. Uh, so it's the new year. If you're a club member, you need to pay your club dues. It's only 75 bucks a year to be a club member. And so we ask you to go to our website, austinwoodsandwaters.org. Jimmy, if you would scroll that on the banner down there, pay your dues at austinwoodsandwaters.org. And also, uh, Richard, if you're listening or Jimmy, you either or Marianne for that matter, uh, why don't you go to the website, the austinwoodsandwaters.org website, go to the membership page get that link and let's put that into the comments. Let's make it easy for our members and future members to go to um, uh, our website and pay our dues there. So um, if you're not familiar with our club, uh, we just have annual dues or not much or 75 bucks, but uh, it'll allow you to get in and, and uh, enjoy our hunting and fishing trips and enjoy our camaraderie in, in, in our meetings here. So yes, absolutely. Please uh, get your membership renewed or join today. If you're on Facebook live today, we do have a link on that Facebook page, probably up a little bit, but it said, say something like join now or, or click here to join something along those lines. It's probably red and a button, but uh, you can, Get, definitely get to there uh, in that capacity. Lastly, I want to mention uh, that we do have a few hunting trips uh, still to go uh, on here. I think there's um, a duck hunt in East Texas. And uh, where do I need to find those in my game bag? I need to mention the game bag too. I'm not finding those. I apologize. Oh, here we go. January 24th, we have a Sandhill Crane hunt. You want to do that January 31st, which should be the last day of the season. Uh, we got a duck in East uh, Zone goose hunt uh, on there, and then there's some couple goose hunts in February as well before the hunting season winds down. So if you want to do some sandhill cranes, some duck or goose hunting, uh, we'd certainly invite you to join us um, uh, on those club duck hunts there. Lastly, I do want to mention that we do have a monthly newsletter. Uh, it's called the Game Bag, and uh, it's available to those members here. And it's got all our stuff uh, about what's happening in the club uh, and other good stuff, such as uh, some reports on some of our club hunting trips and such. So uh, it's been a fantastic uh, newsletter uh, that you would get on a monthly basis. Uh, in our um, February meeting, will be, uh, we won't have the noon meeting uh, in February. We have our officers installation banquet. That's gonna be on the first Wednesday of the month and that'll be an evening event. Typically we get together at County Line on the lake and um, you know share a beverage or two and a hunting story or two and, and uh, pay tribute and uh, acknowledge uh, and recognize our new board members and officers there. Uh, it's open to all the club members. And so we need to have that event. That's gonna be again, uh, online virtual here 
on a Zoom type of format uh, in uh, the first Wednesday of the month uh, in the evening, six or seven, probably seven, seven p.m. So look for more information on that. All right, enough of me. Uh, we're going to bring in our guest speaker now. Uh, our guest speaker this month is Mr. Tim Birdsong. Timothy Birdsong goes by Tim, and he's with Texas Parks and Wildlife. He um, handles the uh, freshwater fisheries, and in particular rivers, and some of the conservation um, measures, so not, not some, probably all of the conservation measures uh, associated with Texas rivers. He's going to talk to us today a little bit about fishing rivers and, and conservation uh, methods and such like that. So uh, he's uh, had written a number of books uh, as a biologist uh, and, um, you know, is, is, is renowned in, in the biology and in fisheries management world. So, Tim, thank you for joining us today. I see you're on the screen here. I know you're going to have a wonderful PowerPoint presentation. Of course, that has to happen during this broadcast. Um, so welcome, Tim Birdsong, to our Walston Woods and Waters Club. And uh, tell us. Tell us about river fishing. Yeah, thanks Thanks for that introduction. And I really appreciate the invitation from Austin Woods and Waters Club to uh, highlight river fishing opportunities in the state. Talk a little bit about efforts to conserve species like wild bass, our, our official state fish. It's the 30th anniversary this year of concerted efforts to to manage and conserve Guadalupe bass, ensure that that fish is around for future generations of, of Texas anglers to to fish for in some of these real, you know, beautiful, scenic, clear, spring-fed hill country streams. I'll, I'll be talking a lot about these uh, hill country uh, streams during today's talk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit on some fishing opportunities uh, statewide though, but, but generally emphasize uh, Central Texas, given that uh, this presentation is to the Austin Woods and Waters Club. So thanks everybody for spending your lunch break with us and it's uh, even if it is virtual, it's great to spend time and connect with other folks who share a, a love for fishing and hunting and in the outdoors. Uh, that river there, if you're not familiar, that's the Devil's River near Del Rio. That's uh, the most pristine river in the in Texas, arguably the most pristine river in the southwestern United States. Really a fabulous place to visit. That's the the Dan Allen Hughes unit of our Devil's River State Natural Area. It's not not open to the public yet. We've been working with uh, State Parks Division to to open that that side, and, and it should be should be open for camping and other uses in the near future. It is open right now as a takeout for for paddles. Uh, there's another shot of, of the Devil's River and and me uh, pre pandemic before I had the the COVID beard. I'll point you to the, the Instagram and Facebook uh, feeds there on the screen, and then also this, this website, tpwd.texas.gov backslash riverfishing. So a lot of the maps that I'll share today are accessible from that, that web page. Uh, a lot of information that we post on the Instagram and Facebook page about river conservation efforts in the state. Anytime we have new river access sites opening up, we'll, we'll highlight those on those social media pages so please check that out there's also my email address and my phone number so feel free to reach out give me feedback ask questions happy to connect with you all so a little bit of background i work for uh, texas parks and wildlife department specifically with the the inland fisheries division we have about 200 biologists and technicians and other staff that are that are spread throughout the state we work to provide the best possible fishing opportunities and in the state while conserving aquatic resources. We spend a lot of time working to manage and conserve the diversity of, of Texas freshwater fishes and their habitats. We have 191 species of native freshwater fishes in the state. About 40% of those are imperiled and they need some action to uh, ensure that, that they persist for future uh, generations. And quite a few of those are, are endemic. They're found in Texas, nowhere else in the world. They may be found in one river in Texas, nowhere else in the world. So. We really want to make sure that those species are around in the future. And so we, we do this work in public freshwater systems, which um, consists of about 1.7 million surface acres. That includes over 1,100 lakes and ponds and over 191,000 miles of streams and, and creeks and rivers. Here's a, a map. This is a little inside baseball, that, but these are our office locations around the state, each of those 
color-coded groups of counties. That's a separate district fisheries office. And so uh, those local district offices, they work to manage and conserve uh, fisheries and, and community fishing lakes and ponds and rivers and lakes in, in their districts. So there's work going on all around all around the state right now. We've got five, five freshwater fish hatcheries, a couple of images from our fish hatchery there on the left side of the screen. And then we've got a number of, of statewide programs, our outreach program, research, we have a rivers program. These all work for statewide. And again, some of the work that we do, we, we do lots of uh, surveys, fish population assessments on rivers, reservoirs. Uh, we do, as, as shown in the lower left there, a lot of these, um, these surveys that are targeting imperiled species, a lot of minnows and, and native fishes that, that we're keeping track of and and um, trying to work with, with water management authorities. We're working with sister state agencies that have oversight of of uh, water quality and, and flows and water level management. And we're trying to ensure that fish and wildlife and, and uh, you know, water-based recreation has a seat at the table on a lot of these decisions that are being made about our natural resources in the state. The upper left photo, that's that's at uh, Lake Livingston, downstream of Lake Livingston on the Trinity River. That's a uh, primary source of uh, broodstock for a striped bass hatchery program. And then the lower right, those are some Florida bass uh, fingerlings that, that we stock in, in public waters. And so on average, annually, these are the kinds of things that we're doing as, as a group. We're stocking 13 to 14 million fish in public waters, about 400 different water bodies. That's, you know, lakes, rivers, ponds that we're stocking around the state annually, conducting about 300 surveys on, on reservoirs. Over 50 rivers are surveyed annually. We, we're generally, uh, 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 average year, we're conducting about 25 fish habitat improvement projects, 50 research projects, more than 60 aquatic invasive species management projects, that's a, a big emphasis on managing floating vegetation that blocks uh, motor access and motor access in, in uh, East Texas on East Texas reservoirs, but we're also investing heavily in, in efforts to prevent the spread of, of zebra mussels. We're investing in control of riparian invasive species like a rundo and salt cedar that can really change the, um, the morphology of, of streams and, and negatively impact habitat for species. And most years we're, we're adding roughly 10 new angle access um, projects in the state. That's, that's inclusive of our boat ramp grant program. So we're, we're funding renovation or construction of new boat ramps. We're supporting river access leases uh, for fishing access. We're, we're also adding paddling trail access sites so roughly 10 new sites added annually. And then, and then unfortunately, we're conducting about 100 fish kill investigations annually and about the same number of proactive consultations where we're working with, with groups that are, you know, whether it's renovating a dam or a, a bridge, um, any, any type of project that's affecting uh, water resources that may negatively impact fish habitat and fish populations. So, you know, we're trying to positively influence those projects. We're helping with the planning and design. We're, we're helping with uh, strategies to minimize and avoid impacts to, to fish populations. So that's, that's a little bit of what we do today. I'm gonna focus uh, in on what we do to, to manage and conserve rivers, river fisheries. Um, here are a couple of photos of who usually tags along with me when I'm hanging out on rivers. There's my, my uh, unfortunately my, my chocolate lab passed away in 2020, got a new dog recently, but he spent a lot of time with me tromping around streams like Gungan Creek that's there in that, that photo that's near my house in Southwest Austin. And the lower photo, that's my 12 year old son, uh, Micah. And that was that was uh, last summer. We spent some time uh, doing some, some camping and fishing on the Lano River upstream of Kingsland. But in this map, you'll see we've, we've got 15 major river basins in the state and uh i'm sure you can see that cursor but in the panhandle that gray area we've got the south canadian river that flows out of mexico uh, through the panhandle into oklahoma into the arkansas river in oklahoma and then we've got the red river uh, which is 
the you know the Red River stream bed is jurisdiction of Oklahoma, but we've got a number of tributaries, a couple of different forks of the Red, the Wichita River, the Bodart, Lower Bodart uh, Creek that flow into the Red River. We've got the uh, Sulphur, the Cy Cypress Basin flows into Caddo Lake, uh, the Sabine River that is serves as the border with a portion of it serves as the border of Louisiana with Louisiana, uh, the Natchez River, the Trinity, which flows through. Uh, Dallas Fort Worth, Houston, on into Galveston Bay. We've got the the, the Brazos River, which flows through Waco. The uh, Colorado River flows through Austin and Matagorda Bay. Several several more smaller coastal basins. Uh, got the Guadalupe River, San Antonio River, both flow into San Antonio Bay, and then the the Nueces, Sabinal, Frio. All of those streams come together uh, to form the the Nueces River, which flows into Nueces Bay and Corpus Christi Bay, and then you've got the Rio Grande, which uh, includes this, you know, this big bend reach of the Rio Grande is pretty, pretty famous. The paddle through Santa Elena Canyon, the Lower Canyon is really beautiful uh, stretch of river to, uh, to experience, and then the Pecos River and the canyons of the Lower Pecos, and, the, and then there's the Devil's River, which I'll, I'll talk about. That's another tributary of the of the Rio Grande. So 15 major river basins, uh, most of those flow uh, southeast across the state. We've got 191,228 miles of, of streams, creeks, and rivers in the state that ranks third nationally, as you would, as you might expect, uh, third nationally behind Alaska and, and California. When it comes to perennially flowing streams, um, substantially less. I mean, we've got not near the, the amount of rainfall that you have in the southeastern part of the U.S. or the Pacific Northwest. So so states like Alabama, Georgia, Virginia, Oregon, Washington, Montana, um, California, Alaska, obviously the, all of those states have more perennially flowing streams than we do, but but 40,000 miles of streams, that's a lot of, of continually flowing streams that we have access to. That that photo there, that's on the, the Lano River south of Mason. And uh, that bluff there, that's that's Martin's Bluff. Uh, the, the Martin family ranch is right there. And it's a famous famous scene that's been pictured in Texas highways, a number of other different different magazines. But great place to go fish for for Guadalupe bass. Really beautiful reach of stream south of Mason. So in, in Texas, um, you know we've seen some some significant trends toward increases in the number of, of paddlers and this is canoes kayaks stand-up paddle boards and and that trend is is consistent nationwide the most recent survey uh, we have consists of data from back in 2014 but the outdoor industry association conducts these periodic uh, surveys of, of paddle sports and uh, paddle sports um, enthusiasts and and we just see these exponential increases in the number of, of paddlers every time they conduct one of these surveys, which is usually about every three to five years. Uh, so the last survey, 22, roughly 22 million Americans participated in paddle sports. About 35% of those were, um, they identified themselves as freshwater uh, water anglers. And and we're, we're seeing a lot of folks on kayaks in particular accessing Texas rivers and uh, and also uh, reservoirs, but especially rivers and uh, rivers are really popular. They they haven't been as popular in, in Texas in recent years with the the boom in uh, reservoir construction back in the, the 50s and 60s. We had reservoirs all around the state that folks would would target for freshwater fishing, mostly focused around largemouth bass, Florida bass, um, striped bass fisheries. Uh, that sort of thing. But more recently, we've, we've seen a, a big interest, a big uptick in, in interest in, in river fishing in the state. And uh, part of it's paddle sports, part of it's interest in, in fly fishing. And uh, just a recognition that you don't have to necessarily target trout if you're a fly angler. The, we've got some really high quality fly fishing opportunities for species like Guadalupe bass and Rio Grande cichlid, largemouth bass, um, common carp and other other species. Uh, but nationwide, we've got about 30 million anglers, and about 45% of those anglers identify 
themselves as, as river anglers. So we've been investing more and more resources in providing opportunities for river fishing in Texas. Back in uh, 2005, 2006, we launched the, the Texas Paddling Trails Program. And what this was, was, a, was an opportunity to connect with municipalities, mostly cities, counties, some state parks, but um, public properties that were situated along rivers where we could, we could advertise those sites as dedicated areas to go launch a kayak, either do a loop paddle or launch a kayak and then paddle downstream and take out at some defined uh, takeout point. But, but try to provide these more kind of family friendly, easy to plan type of, of outdoor adventures on, on rivers uh, using these existing public river access sites. Uh, but just provide some consistent signage and, and we have a website that provides folks with a lot of information on what to expect at that site, what species to target, how many hours they're going to need to set aside for that kind of a trip. Um, just trying to make it as easy as possible to get people out on, on rivers. And, and so we now have um, about 70, a little over 70 trails statewide. A subset of those are on rivers, about 54 of those are on, on, on rivers and uh, 93 ac distinct access areas um, statewide. So nearly 400 miles of river, as I mentioned, 40,000 miles of perennially flowing streams. And we've got public access through the paddling trails program to about 400 of that. So we still need to need to do some work. And the situation that, that we're in in Texas is, is no different than most other private lands states. So in, in Texas, um, about 95% of the landscape is in private ownership, and that's reflected with ownership of, of riverbanks as well. So a lot of our riverbanks are, are privately owned, so it's difficult to get to the river. Uh, most of our major rivers and their tributaries are publicly owned. They're, these are state-owned stream beds. Public has the right to, to move up and down those, those streams. Um, it's, it's a little nuanced. Uh, of course, because you get into whether the, there are patents or grants of, of land from the governments of, of Spain and Mexico, the Republic of Texas, the state of Texas. So some of those surveys were, were unique and, and different. And so there's been some effort by the legislature to try to reconcile that. And I won't go into detail there. I'll point you to a couple of articles that you can read to get more detail on on. Uh, navigability and, and state ownership of, of stream beds uh, that can help inform where you where you go fishing. But in general, most of our major rivers and their tributaries are uh, state-owned stream beds. And, and those tributaries up to a point where the width of the stream averages less than 30 feet in width. That's kind of a general a general uh, rule to go by. Uh, but I can I can um, again, point you to some articles where you'll get some additional detail on um, just being informed when you're out on the water and understanding whether or not you're you're on you know you're in a stream that may be considered uh, private, uh, but more often than not, the, these larger rivers are going to be um, state-owned, and and whether it's um, something that's floatable or whether it's a reach of stream that is has expansive shoals or it's a karst landscape where maybe the the river goes subsurface and then it re-emerges later um or you know and there's definitely quite a few situations like that in, in parts of of the hill country or um you know maybe you have uh significant outcrops granite outcrops boulders places like the the lano that i'll show you during this presentation there there are boulder fields where it, it would be really difficult to paddle through some of these areas, but you have the right, as long as you stay in the stream bed, to be able to, to hike and wade fish um, those areas. So, so it doesn't necessarily require that you can float a boat to be able to, um, to have legal access to these streams. And so we, we did a survey of, of paddlers um, back in 2015 and um, no surprise, they, they said, you know, lack of quality of river access was second only to inadequate river flows on their, their, their list of things that we as a management agency really need to focus in on. So we've been trying to improve access, but as I said, we've got, we've got limited, a limited amount of publicly held lands along rivers. 
So our solution to that was, was to borrow a page from our public hunting program, which leases private land for public hunting opportunities. And so we started back in 2012, leasing private land for river, river fishing access. So here's another map that, that shows locations again of some of the paddling trails there in blue and, and then in red, you'll see dots um, that are represent locations of some of these fishing access leases that, that we have set up. And we, we tried to play off of the paddling trail sites. And so if you had existing paddling trail sites, we're adding another um, access lease, you know, five to 10 miles downstream or upstream of that. So it's not just point access for banker wade fishing. It's, it provides an opportunity to paddle a, a length of river, you know, a five to 10 mile uh, reach of river. So we're trying to trying to expand uh, reaches of river that you can you can paddle on a kayak, a canoe, a raft, and go fishing. So we've added 24 of these fishing access leases since 2012, and most of that's been funded through uh, grants, federal grants from the U.S. Farm Bill. And um, so we we provide some some funding to these uh, these these private landowners to allow public access. We're, we're doing a lot of work to track usage of those sites and advertise those, promote those and, and get people out using these, these uh, waters. And there's a conservation angle there because we want people on rivers. We want people to, to use those resources because they're, they're an outstanding recreational opportunity. But we also want folks to appreciate rivers and then make decisions to help conserve rivers, whether that's voting decisions or otherwise, you know, we want people to understand uh, the importance of keeping these, these rivers flowing. So I'm going to show uh, this map a few times. Um, you'll see the white squares. Those are paddling trail access sites. The black triangles, those are fishing access leases that we have set up in the state. And, and then you see these kind of four broad regions of the state. We've got um, the Panhandle, Southern Great Plains, where you got places like the Canadian Red River, the Upper Brazos, these wide sandy streams. And then in the Chuan Desert ecoregion, the Trans Pecos, you've got these desert streams like the Big Bend Reach of the Rio Grande, the Pecos and Canyon systems that are really, really interesting. And then you've got the, the Hill Country, the Edwards Plateau ecoregion in Central Texas, a lot of uh, karst limestone, spring-fed, clear streams, most of these harbor Guadalupe bass, also some really good opportunities to catch Rio Grande cichlid and largemouth bass. And then uh, East Texas and the, and the coastal plains, I just grouped that together, Gulf Coastal Plains. This is most of our main stem rivers, a little, little more turbid, higher sediment load, uh, different kind of, kind of fishing opportunity for sure in those kind of bigger main stem river reaches not as as rocky or clear as some of the, the areas in the northwest part of the state so here I'll, I'll, you'll you'll see these red rectangles just to draw your attention to particular so I'm, I'm highlighting here the devil's river which is shown in those those photographs we've got a couple of access leases on the devil's river which historically has not had uh, very good public access we've got a couple of a couple of state natural areas that that do offer access and then we've we've added some some leases uh, to make it even easier for folks to get out and enjoy the, the Devil's River and target smallmouth bass. Uh, so this is one of our best smallmouth bass fisheries in the state. Um, smallmouth bass were stocked in Lake Amistad and have, have moved up into the, the Devils. Uh, you can also catch a native form of, of largemouth bass that's found in the Devils. So this, this largemouth bass shown here on the left, uh, that's that's probably a Florida bass. So Florida bass were stocked in Amistad and have moved up into parts of the Devils. There's also a, a subspecies of largemouth bass that we call Devils River bass that's still in the, the headwaters portions of, of the Devils River and in Dolan Creek. Uh, it was actually the first fish I ever caught on a fly rod, so that was that was pretty memorable. But um, just a, a beautiful river, definitely a wilderness experience, something you have to prepare for something I would probably recommend that you get a, a fishing guide if you want to get out there and, and, and do some, some fishing for smallmouth bass. So um, here's a map that sh shows the, the river as it flows down into and is impounded by, by uh, the dam at Lake Amistad. And 
you can see uh, Baker's Crossing on that map, which is a bridge crossing where most folks launch their kayak. You can paddle down to that that first black triangle, and you know, it's a paddle up only site where you can you can do some overnight camping. You can also camp at the Del Norte unit of the Devil's River State Natural Area. Uh, the next access site in between the Del Norte unit and Dan Allen Hughes unit was really critical to opening up that that reach of, of rivers. So there's a paddle up only opportunity there to to stay overnight and uh, and then make your way down to the Dan Allen Hughes unit for the, for the takeout. So you just have to get on the, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department webpage. You can go to state parks, find the Devil's River State Natural Area, and it'll walk you through how you go about reserving those campsites on the river. You also need a access permit if you want to use any of the TPWD properties or the lease access sites on the river. So you get a, you get a permit, you make reservations. Uh, that's a way to do it yourself, or you can you can work with a number of different uh, fishing guides. But since we opened up those two access leases on the Devils, um, about thirty percent of the paddlers that were permitted to use the river have used those sites. And one of the big problems that we had before we added those leases was that people would just, uh, you know, they, they really, these are too, too long a distances between Baker's Crossing and the Del Norte unit and then from Del Norte down to Dan Allen Hughes to be able to, to reasonably paddle and fish in a day. And so most people end up just pulling over on the river and trying to find a campsite. And there aren't, there are not very many legal campsites. Um, so most folks end up trespassing on private property or they end up paddling into the night hours and you know you get caught in a difficult situation on one of the shoals or riffles and and uh, dump your boat and lose a lot of camping gear so we we've been documenting since we opened up these access sites a reduction in the amount of, of trash on the river and also a reduction in the number of reported cases of, of trespassing so that's that's been a real positive news. This is one of those, um, these are a couple of the leases that we hold up as being a real effective success story. It's, it's helped uh, reduce some of the conflicts that we were seeing between paddlers, anglers, and uh, landowners along this reach of river. So definitely a success story. So uh, here's the Devil's River again on this map. So kind of the Western edge of the hill country, we would characterize it as the intersection of the Chuan Desert and Edwards Plateau ecoregions but you know, kind of western edge of the hill country here. And then you see all these other clear spring fed streams that emerge off of this, this limestone plateau. So a number of different streams that are tributaries of the, the Colorado, like the Concho, Brady Creek, San Saba, the Llano, Pedernales. Uh, these all flow into uh, the Colorado. The, the photos on the screen here, this is Onion Creek, which flows in, um, Flows in through uh, Dripping Springs, Buda, um, into um, southeast Austin. So it's not shown on the map, but it's it flows into uh, kind of south Austin. And uh, the photos are specifically of McKinney Falls State Park, uh, which is where our Parks and Wildlife headquarters office is. So this is actually right behind my my office. I spend a lot of time here uh, during my lunch breaks. But you've got other tributaries of of um, the Nueces, the Sabinaw, Frio, both flow into the Nueces here on the southern part of the plateau. The Medina is a tributary of the San Antonio River. And then you've got the Guadalupe River. And up in the headwaters, you got streams like the, the uh, North Fork, South Fork, Johnson Creek. Um, so lots of different clear spring-fed hill country streams where you can go target species like like Guadalupe bass. And these are pretty well known and promoted, um, routinely promoted in, in mainstream fishing publications like Southwest Fly Fishing. I've seen a number of articles in Bassmaster and Bass Times. And, and, uh, and then most recently, there was a story in this month's issue of Texas Highways that focused on fly fishing opportunities, fishing opportunities in the hill country streams and efforts to conserve uh, Guadalupe bass. And so we've We've tried to get a better handle on usage of hill country streams. We did a hill country angler survey that was published back in 2015. And just to get a, thought this would be interesting information to share just on um, percentage of those anglers that use different, uh, different, um, you know, different 
uh, float tubes or canoes or kayaks or other types of boats or, or uh, wade fish. Uh, a lot of different different ways that boats access hill country streams, but access is an issue. It was second only to the need for fish habitat improvements. Uh, about 94% of anglers said, yeah, we need to, Parks and Wildlife needs to keep focusing on trying to keep these rivers flowing and keep the habitats in good condition. And uh, roughly three quarters of those surveyed said, yeah, we need better better river access. So we've been targeting a lot of the resources that we have available through this leasing program uh, towards the, the hill country. Another interesting outcome of that, that survey was we, we calculated economic value of, of stream fishing in the hill country and and it was nearly 72 million over a, over a 16 month period that's that's pretty significant you compare that to some uh, reservoirs like lake fork some of the others you know that that you hear a lot about that are anywhere from you know 10 to 14 17 million annually in economic impact so this was a really impressive number and it just shows that a lot of folks are getting out on the hill country to hill country streams to fish most of those folks are, are traveling from places like you know dfw austin san antonio houston so they're bringing a, they're bringing a lot of a lot of resources into those smaller communities they're staying in in uh, bed and breakfasts and hotels and they're eating their restaurants and buying gas and buying food and so it, it really is a, a benefit to those those communities in in the central part of the state so I highlight a few specific uh, fishing opportunities on these hill country streams. Uh, this is the Llano. So you're seeing the headwaters of the Llano, the South Llano, and that, that, uh, that red rectangle on the left, and then uh, kind of the main stem Llano on the, on the right there. So here's a, here's a map. All these maps that I'll show are available on that uh, river fishing webpage that I referenced earlier. So here's the South Llano River, it flows it flows uh, northwest to southeast, where it uh, confluences with the North Llano River to form the main stem Llano. So you've got a couple of stream crossings on County Road 377, uh, where you can you can access and do some some wade fishing or float fishing. We've added uh, one lease at CR 150, that's County Road 150 access, and so that's about four and a half miles from one of the bridges that serves as a pretty good launch. Uh, you could also launch from County Road 150 and paddle. You know, that's roughly seven and a half miles down to the South Llano River State Park as a takeout. And then if you wanted to paddle uh, from the South Llano River State Park down into Junction, you're looking at about six miles. So those, you know, roughly six miles is a pretty good, pretty good day paddle if you really want to take your time to do some fishing. So a great place to target Guadalupe Bass, really scenic Reacher River and as far as densities, you know, higher densities of Guadalupe Bass from the South Llano River State Park down to Junction than just about any other place that we've we've surveyed in the in the hill country. This is a little further downstream. This, this these are some photos that I took from a trip to Castell, uh, southeast of of Mason, uh, back in November. So did some did some fishing there, and here's a really pretty. Guadalupe bass that I caught. So most of you are familiar with the Castell General Store. You see the Castell Castell Crossing shown on the map there. We have a, a lease access site there, a couple of other lease access sites upstream and, and downstream that provide um, good places for, for launch or takeout. So you've got really four different reaches of stream that you could easily plan um, a kite fishing trip on. And some of those, if you don't mind wet wading, um, you know, I've, I've, that's mostly what I've done when I've gone to this reach of stream is just, just, uh, kind of do a loop, but, but do some, some wet wading upstream, downstream, um, a lot of boulders to, to hike through and, um, you know, definitely a good place to paddle as well, but I just, I really enjoy wet wading in the, in the spring and fall. So these are relatively new leases that were established over the last few years. You can see this is this is an area that's in between Mason and Llano. So uh, if you're based here in Austin, which I assume most of your club members are, this is a real easy day trip. You can drive up, uh, do some fishing, go to uh, Cooper's Barbecue there in Llano or one of the other local 
establishments. It's a really, really fun day. There's pretty good sized largemouth bass that I caught in that area last summer. And further downstream, you're getting closer to Kingsland. This is downstream of, of Llano, closer to Kingsland. Um, some of you may be familiar with Long's Fish Camp. This is just downstream of Long's, just upstream of the Kingsland Slab RV Park or the Kingsland, Kingsland Slab uh, Bridge Crossing. So a really pretty reach of river. Some of the, the biggest squirrel bass that I've caught in the hill country. This was this was last uh, August, I think, when I caught caught this fish. So really beautiful reach of stream. This is a little bit further downstream last this past November. Um, nice large mouth bass. And uh, here's a here's a wild bass that I caught in this area. This is really close to the Kingston Slab, which a lot of folks target in the uh, March to May time frame during the wide bass run as they move out of Lake LBJ. So here's a slide I put together to highlight some places you could go to catch Guadalupe bass in the hill country. We've got a number of Texas paddling trails. Maybe do a screen grab of this uh, slide if, if you want to, but there's, uh, you know, there's five or six paddling trails that you would expect to catch Guadalupe bass on, several fishing access leases that I've highlighted already and then a number of different state parks. Um, some of those have a paddling trail at the state park. Some just have ever access and you could, you could do some wader bank fishing there, but lots of places to go catch the, the state fish of Texas. So I mentioned the white bass run there on the Llano. Um, you know, we've got these white bass populations and, and a number of different reservoirs around the state and in the spring, they will they'll swim upstream. They'll they'll migrate upstream to spawn in the rivers. And uh, this is uh, Rymer's Ranch. This is a county county park that is uh, near Bee Cave. But this is the lower portion of the the Pedernales River. This picture here behind this uh, list of areas to to catch a Guadalupe bass. That's the Pedernales River at Pedernales Falls State Park. This is the area referred to as the swim beach there at Pernalis Falls State Park. It's a great place to go catch uh, Guadalupe bass. And so further downstream on the same river, this is what it looks like uh, before it flows into Lake Travis. And so you, you have a white bass run up from Lake Travis and you can see all these folks that are there. This is last spring, uh, right as COVID was starting to take off. And uh, you can see folks out there targeting white bass here's my kids doing a little little white bass fishing uh, but these these white bass fisheries are really economically valuable valuable a uh, number of different places to go colorado bend state park is probably the most popular white bass fishery uh, did an economic impact study about 2.8 million in economic value from that white bass fishery over a three-month period there just at colorado bend uh, State Park. A lot of people traveling out there to to catch some white bass. And these uh, red red squares. I'm just pointing to a number of different sites where you could go uh, catch white bass in a river during their spring spawning migrations. So uh, here's that reach of the Pedernales that I just showed pictures of, and then the Kingsland Slab just upstream of of Lake LBJ. And here's a general location of. Uh, Colorado Bend State Park. There's also a really popular white bass run on the Natchez River uh, upstream of, of uh, Lake Palestine. So this is near Chandler, the Chandler River Park. It's shown here on this map. So a couple of different access sites. It's a paddle trail launch, but there's a little bit of property where you can, you can bank fish. You can also uh, launch kayak and depending on the stage of the white bass run, you could paddle upstream or downstream and, and do pretty well. And then this is a uh, Grand Bluff boat ramp, one of our fishing access leases on the, the Sabine uh, River. It's a really quality white bass um, run, but lots of other white bass runs around the state. I grew up around Lake Texoma and there are a number of different tributaries of the Red River that um, where white bass will move up during the spring. Um, so lots, lots of opportunities around the state that you can check into, but these that I've just highlighted are some of the more popular and, and where we have some dedicated access sites 
So I'm going to get to those. And uh, now I want to get into the lower Colorado River, which is our trophy Guadalupe bass fishery. Um, you should know about this if, if you're in Austin. If you haven't fished the lower Colorado yet, you need to you need to go check it out. But there's there's really good access and just very low levels of usage, and we can't can't quite figure out why. But it's a it's a really great you know wilderness setting. We've got paddling trails and lease fishing access sites. Uh, this is one of the shoals. There are a number of these shoals where you can do some weight fishing around the shoals and catch Guadalupe bass, channel catfish, white bass. This is at McKinney Ruffs Nature Park. So you, you have to hike for about a mile and a half from this park, which is a lower Colorado River Authority managed park, uh, but really good access there to a couple of different big shoals that you could, you could weight fish at, but also a lot of good um, areas to kayak launch. You could put a John boat on this river pretty easily, but here's fish that I caught off that shoal right there. So here's a uh, you know, Guadalupe bass. Sun caught a nice channel catfish, caught a white bass. A um, little further downstream. So um, here's this uh, Woolbarger Bend. This is the general area where that McKinney Ruffs Nature Park is, is located. Um, you get further downstream, you work your way into city of Bastrop and then down towards towards Smithville and you can you can access these paddling trails that are set up near Bastrop. We've got a couple of fishing access leases, WJF river access, Hidden Shores are really uh, high quality sites. The, the, they're shown in the pictures there, Hidden Shores, there's a big bend in the river, big sandstone bluff that's shown here in the background. That's a really nice squally bass that one of my colleagues caught. And uh, here's what the launch looks like there at Hidden Shores. So we, that particular day, we launched from WJF, paddled down to Hidden Shores, had lunch, and then took out down at this public boat ramp. So you just got to do a little planning, but you, you can definitely uh, do it yourself. If you've got a friend, you can work out a shuttle. But really great access up and down the, the Colorado from Austin all the way down to, uh, to Smithville. And... Uh, Several guide services, all water, all waters guide service, um, Alvin Dito, and uh, you know several other other guides. Lene Dito, his his um, partner there, they uh, they guide this Reach River and do a lot of work to try to promote um, the value of this river and to uh, help conserve the river. So they they've organized the Lower Colorado River, low, they call it the Loco uh, Trash Bash. And a couple of summers prior to the pandemic coming online, uh, great efforts to to uh, remove um, trash from the river and just try to promote a conservation ethic of, among Austinites and folks in the area that that should be working to conserve this really awesome resource that we have close to close to home here. Number of different tributaries of the, the Lower Colorado River. We've got places like uh, Onion Creek in southeast and southwest austin uh, so onion creek flows through um, mckinney falls state park and then you got mckinney falls parkway which is a bridge crossing and several properties owned by travis county and city of austin that you can access along onion creek this is another photo of, of mckinney falls state park but you can pretty much hike and wade fish all the way down to the confluence with the colorado river uh, this is uh, fishing behind my office there at McKinney Falls State Park. You can see the falls in the, the lower falls of the park there in the background. Uh, this is a little further downstream underneath the McKinney Falls Parkway Bridge. Really nice Guadalupe bass that was caught there. Uh, this is downstream of the bridge. You're starting to get into some areas that are owned by Travis County. And uh, they're working to establish a green belt along the, the creek. Um, hardly see anybody out there fishing this reach stream. Great place to catch Guadalupe bass. This is uh, right around the toll road 130 crossing where it crosses Highway 71. And it looks like, pretty much looks like this all the way down to the, the confluence of the Colorado. So a great place to go kind of hike and wade fish, wet wade in the spring and fall. Really beautiful area. 
And then, you know, I've, I've found so many small streams in uh, South Austin that are, that are worth fishing. This is uh, a hike and bike trail along Slaughter Creek, runs parallel to Slaughter, Slaughter Road there in South Austin, from, uh, runs all the way from 1826, past Mopac East, um, over to, uh, um, I guess I-35. And so, you know, Slaughter Creek flows into Onion Creek right around I-35. There's a fish that my kid caught during the, the pandemic out of this tiny, tiny little creek. Uh, but some great places to go fishing that other people aren't, aren't checking out. This is my younger son caught this largemouth bass out of Bear Creek, which is uh, another tributary of, of Onion Creek. Uh, flows into Onion Creek just east of I-35, just upstream of Old San Antonio Road. So definitely some places worth checking out that uh, you just have to be careful about land ownership and um, knowing whether it's city, county, or, or private, or just knowing the landowner and having some permissions, but some great waters to target that not too many people know about. Everybody's hitting the, the city and county uh, you know, community fishing lakes, the HOA fishing lakes right now, those those have been hit hard during the pandemic, but there are lots of small streams, creeks, rivers worth worth targeting. Uh, a couple other places I'll highlight, the Canyon Reservoir Tail Race is, sorry, I'm gonna highlight the San Marcos River first. So here's the um, reach of San Marcos River around Martindale, great place to catch largemouth bass and catch Smallmouth, Guadalupe bass hybrids, and somewhere in there, there's kind of a transition zone from from Guadalupe smallmouth hybrids get into some spotted bass, and a really great place to go go target. This is the Blanco River last last winter. This is almost underneath the I-35 bridge there in San Marcos, the north edge of San Marcos. Um, so, some really great stream fishing opportunity. Here's the Canyon Tail Race. Um, really economically valuable trout fishery. We had a, four different access leases that were set up. We still have one at Camp Waco Springs, but we had for several years there from 2012 to around 2018, we had these four access leases and uh, over 1200 users per month, over 100,000 per month in angler expenditures from use of those sites. So great return on investment there where we're getting people out and, and some of these sites, we, we need to, we're exploring whether or not we can re-up those and extend those leases. But most of these sites, you can just um, pay to access the phenomenal nominal fee at those muster campgrounds, and they'll let you get on. And then, of course, you can join the Guadalupe River Trout Unlimited uh, Lease Access Program. They have a number of private properties that they work with to get their members access to uh, trout fishing opportunities for Mostly rainbow trout and brown trout have been stocked in, in recent years, but most recent studies showed over 84 million in annual economic value from that reach of the of the uh, Guadalupe River downstream of Canyon Lake. So, really economically valuable place. But we're stocking rainbow trout all around the state. This is just this week. So this week we are stocking nearly 50,000 rainbow trout around the state at 54 different locations. It's quite a few of those are or stream reaches, some are community fishing lakes. But uh, this goes on from December through February, and then we're stocking uh, channel cat fishing a lot of those same sites. But plenty of places to get out and go target uh, rainbow trout right now. I want to highlight the Brazos River. There's a chain of, of reservoirs from Possum Kingdom, Granbury, Lake Whitney. Uh, these, this chain of reservoirs upstream of Waco. Uh, provide some really excellent fishing opportunities for smallmouth bass. You get into some areas where you're catching these smallmouth bass, Guadalupe bass, spotted bass hybrids. Hard to tell what what they are, but uh, a lot of fun to fun to catch. Also, some striped bass that have been stocked in those reservoirs that that move in between um, in between those those uh, those lakes and the river. And fun to catch big striped bass out of out of rivers. So. Here's some places you can go target striped bass in rivers. Um, so this this area of the Brazos from um, Possum Kingdom down to downstream of Lake Whitney, uh, those are some good some good reaches of stream to target. Um, that's not a, a striped bass that was caught on a stream. Uh, I caught that striped bass at, at Lake Texoma 
and uh, the smaller striped bass was downstream of Lake Tassum in the Red River. But but there are some striped bass that are stocked in Canyon Lake that move downstream of the, the reservoir that are caught in the, the Canyon Reservoir tail race. And then uh, these striped bass that are found on the Trinity River downstream of, of Lake Livingston. There, there are other places where striped bass are stocked in reservoirs around the state and they move their way upstream or downstream out of those those lakes. And again, a lot of fun to catch from a from kayak. Here's uh, this reach of the Brazos from Lake Whitney down to Waco. We've had a few access leases over the years. You can see we still have this Dick's Canoes access lease where you could, you could paddle from Army Corps of Engineers Park at Lake Whitney, take out a Dick's Canoes. That's a good reach. Um, Brazos River Nature Center, we let that lease lapse. We're, we're talking with the landowner about re -upping. So that's another six miles of river that we can you could paddle and then we're, we're looking at adding additional leases further downstream so you could have a kind of a network of sites to be able to paddle all the way from lake whitney down to waco that's 30 something miles of river that had very little access before we launched this uh, leasing program back in in 2012 but really great uh, fishing for largemouth bass um, spotted smallmouth guadalupe hybrids um, striped bass. <clears throat> so check out this uh, river fishing webpage. So if you want to learn more about our lease access sites or fishing access sites at state parks, or learn more about stream navigation law, there there's a, there's a really good uh, set of articles that that are found there on this page. So um, one on if a river runs through, what law applies? It's really helps you understand. Um, the, the set of laws that, that help influence or inform whether or not you should be uh, targeting certain certain river reaches. So learn, learn more about our paddling trails, our uh, Raqqa River Access and Conservation Areas Program where we have these lease access sites. Um, all the maps that I've shown today, you can download those on this, this web page. It's got links to all of the, the state parks that have fishing access, I've highlighted quite a few of these today that provide access to Guadalupe bass fishing, but there, there are others that provide, like Village Creek State Park in, in uh, the southeastern part of the state provides some really good fishing opportunities for large bass. So we've got all these really high quality fishing opportunities around the state, and that's great. And I've shown you lots of really pretty pictures of rivers, but the reality is that we have lots of, uh, of other stream reaches that are that have been dammed, dredged, drained, polluted, or otherwise dramatically altered. And so these are the kind of situations that we're trying to prevent or that we're trying to trying to work towards some sort of restoration. Because, you know, we need to keep these rivers healthy and flowing so they provide these quality recreational um, opportunities. So we have programs that are set up to address these. And I wanna quickly highlight efforts to conserve our state fish, Guadalupe bass, which has kind of been our charismatic species. We don't have, we don't have salmon. We don't have um, some other charismatic species that's, that's um, that we can kind of hang our hat on to conserve rivers. We've got, we've got this fish, but it's a state fish, a lot of interest in trying to conserve this, this fish. And we've used it to build a river conservation program initially in central Texas. And now we're trying to expand some of the those programs, those strategies into other parts of the state, but it's been pretty easy to get people to uh, get on board with doing what's what's needed to conserve these rivers to benefit this fish. So some great photos of Guadalupe bass that I got from Chris uh, Johnson at Living Waters Fly Fishing. There's my dad on the lower left fishing on Union Creek near my house. I've shown you some of these other pictures already, but some really fun opportunities out there to catch Guadalupe bass. And I'll tell you a quick, quick story on the conservation of the fish, which was which was described in 1874, redescribed in uh, 1942. Back in the in the 70s, we started a, a small bass stocking program, stocked nearly seven million Guadalupe bass in hill country streams. Figured out that they were starting to hybridize with Guadalupe bass, and uh, eventually in the in the 80s. Um, figured out that, hey, this is really something unique. This is found in Texas and nowhere else, and we really need to do what we can to conserve it. So um, Gary Garrett, who's uh, now at the University of Texas at Austin, retired Parks and Wildlife 
biologist, he really initiated this program to uh, save the state fish. And right around the same time, Gulfy Bass was named the official state fish of, of Texas. That was in 1989. Gary published the first Guadalupe Bass Conservation Plan in 1991. This is the 30th anniversary this year. And, and then he came up with a strategy to try to restore Guadalupe Bass to the namesake Guadalupe River by just flooding the system with uh, so many genetically pure Guadalupe Bass that it would just be more fish than the system could handle, could support. And hopefully those genetically pure fish would win out. And uh, slowly you would see hybridization rates or the number of pure smallmouth bass start to decline. And, and that that was effective. That continued for roughly 20 years. We've used that now to accomplish other bass restoration and other rivers. Back in 2009 was, I would say that was a big game changer. Bass Master came out with this, this initiative, Bass Slam, where they were promoting anglers going and catching all the different unique forms of of black bass that are found in rivers around the, this, the nation. So about 10 different unique forms of, of black bass, Guadalupe bass being the species that occurs in Texas. The uh, Some big donors, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, a group called the Southeast Aquatic Resources Partnership. They came in with some really substantial funding to try to address issues and uh, help restore Guadalupe bass and other species. This shows the ranges of these different endemic basses that, that are still being targeted through this initiative. So we've got Guadalupe bass in, in Texas, a couple of unique forms of smallmouth that occur in eastern Oklahoma. Um, we've got species like shoal bass and swanee bass, red-eye bass that occur in parts of Georgia and the Carolinas and Panhandle, Florida. So uh, really cool streams across the southeastern and south central U.S. to go catch these endemic bass. So what we were trying to do was really just restore and preserve the health of these flowing streams. So we took a watershed-based approach, pulled together partners, conducted these landscape assessments, put together a plan, brought together resources, and started putting projects on the ground to restore habitat. And we were just trying to get to the point where we had wild, naturally produced, self-sustaining populations of, of these species. And it was really built around the fish as a keystone species. But you know, we were doing these things to benefit water quality, to um, enhance recreation, enhance economic benefits to these local communities, these river communities. So um, it was really broad based and we had a lot of support from landowners and local community partners. And, and uh, so that, that effort was really launched around 2010. The Upper Llano uh, watershed was the initial focus. We uh, went out and targeted Guadalupe bass, found some genetically pure fish, and um, created a, a brood stock, a hatchery program where we stock, ended up stocking over 700,000 Guadalupe bass to restore that species to the South Land. Uh, we had a hybrid population there from historic stocking of smallmouth bass, and we achieved our genetic restoration target back in 2018. So you can go catch a, a pure Guadalupe bass there now. Big investments in habitat restoration working with uh, a group of landowners throughout that watershed. Real similar outcomes in the Pernalis River watershed, still have genetically pure uh, Guadalupe bass there, no hybridization that we've detected with smallmouth bass. So great place to go catch a, a pure fish. Blanco River had been, the Guadalupe bass population there had been completely lost. So as of um, around 1990, um, Texas State University had documented the loss of Guadalupe bass from the, the Blanco River. So they were they were extirpated due to hybridization with smallmouth bass. We took an opportunity during the drought in 2011 to go in and target these uh, pools that that persisted, and we removed smallmouth bass and hybrids. Came back in 2012 and several years following, and, and stocked uh, Guadalupe bass. We've been monitoring ever since. And, have raised the flag now in, in terms of successfully restoring Guadalupe bass to the upper portions of the of the uh, Blanco River. So that's uh, been a real, um, you know, real great success story for us. Something that's been very rewarding as a biologist to see the state fish restored to one of the rivers in its native range. Worked with uh, San Antonio River Authority, Bear County, some other partners on 
this restoration work on the mission reach of the San Antonio River there in San Antonio and <clears throat> they restored habitat in this in this system it, it was a channelized ditch basically and they they went back and tried to restore uh, um, you know, native riparian community try to create some open uh, connected floodplain establish some shoals and and as part of that we reintroduced Guadalupe bass and they're they're doing well a lot of folks are catching Guadalupe bass in that reach of stream now and that's another exciting project so lots of restoration projects that went on and you know roughly a dozen or so different places around the, the hill country from 2010 to 2015 and that really helped us <clears throat> secure some buy-in from partners around the state and taking this this watershed approach to conserving rivers and conserving fish and all the values that people have uh, for rivers. And so we we did this assessment and said, okay, well, if we wanted to work statewide, it's a big state. Where where do we need to target if we want to preserve the diversity of freshwater fishes in Texas? So I mentioned 191 species in the state. Uh, we've got about 90 of those that are considered imperiled. And if we wanted to make sure that those fish species continue to persist into the future. Where are the places we really need to be working? And so the polygons that are shown here on the map, these are these different focal areas that we call native fish conservation areas where we're really investing, uh, working closely with partners in those watersheds, um, great partnerships with private landowners to restore habitat and ensure those species continue to persist. So uh, since 2010, over 60,000 acres of habitat restoration implemented in those focal watersheds, over 30,000 acres of, of springs and um, streamside areas, small streams, uh, riparian areas that have been preserved through this, this program, the Farm and Ranch Lands Conservation Program in the department. Some of the photos that are on the screen there, these are private lands that we partnered with them to help cost share the purchase of a conservation easement. So these, these areas are not gonna be developed and uh, these streams are gonna continue to persist there and, and serve as quality habitat for, for fish. And so a number of other different programs that we've that we've launched over the last five years. And uh, those were highlighted in a, in a book that several of us recently worked on together. It's uh, called uh, Multi-Species and Watershed Approaches to Freshwater Fish Conservation. But it's it's got about uh, 25 different case studies from around the US just promoting stream conservation efforts and and uh, we have one other book that we've we've done that's called Black Bass Diversity, uh, multi, Multidisciplinary Science for Conservation. And this highlights some of the work that we've done to, to manage and conserve Guadalupe bass, which we try to promote. And the last thing I'll mention is um, if you buy a fishing license, then you're helping fund all the things that I just talked about. So I really appreciate that. If you want to take it a step further, you can buy this Texas Rivers Conservation License Plate for 30 bucks annually and 22 dollars of that goes to support our access program and our um, habitat restoration and species conservation efforts it's helping do all the work that we do to uh, conserve the the state fish so i know i hit you with a lot of info hopefully you did some screen grabs throughout and i think this is probably recorded and you'll be able to go back but if you have any questions feel free to send me an email or give me a give me a call but really appreciate you spending your your lunch break with me thanks a lot thank you tim uh, we do have a couple questions that have come in through the chat here that i'm gonna fire at you here uh hopefully quickly um so uh kevin mcconnell has asked what research projects are underway to eliminate the zebra mussels well we've, we've funded a number of different projects in recent years that looked at downstream dispersal. So looking at how uh, these zebra mussels, how well they move downstream of, of the reservoirs that they're um, infested in. Um, you know, we've, this is a relatively new issue for us in Texas, but uh, the issue with zebra mussels has been going on for, for many decades in the Great Lakes. So research has been done for quite a while now on on um, treatment strategies, control strategies, ways to eliminate um, zebra mussels from infested lakes. And, and there's, there just is, has not been a silver bullet that's been found yet. So our, our efforts have really been focused around prevention 
So a lot of uh, monitoring at high-risk lakes, a lot of public outreach. We have a uh, outreach and prevention campaign that puts a lot of resources into getting people to clean, drain, and dry their boat and not move zebra mussels around from, from one lake to another. But yeah, big focus on prevention. And the research that we've funded so far has been um, has been focused on um, trying to eliminate some of those pathways where zebra mussels end up being moved from one infested water body to to another water body. Um, so yeah, that's that's been a, a primary focus. But we've got monitoring programs set up, and and as I said, you know, outreach to prevent is really key because once it's once they're infested, there's really not an effective uh, tool to to get them removed. I will say that we did find zebra mussels that had been in, introduced into Lake Waco at one of the boat ramps. And uh, our biologists came up with a, what was a pretty innovative strategy. They used um, some plastic liner to cover the substrates and basically suffocate uh, those areas where zebra mussels were, were found and uh, in, this, in this one cove. And we've gone back and monitored uh, since then and I found that um, you know, we're just not detecting zebra mussels in Lake Waco anymore. So that, that's one of the only uh, success stories that we have for uh, treatment or removal, eradication of uh, zebra mussels from an infested water body. Sounds good. And that's good news. Uh, last question uh, that we're going to have is from Chris Liu. How much should I expect to invest in order to get into paddling, whether it be kayaking, canoeing, paddle boarding? you know, to get certified, purchase equipment, get permits, et cetera, and be ready to get out on the water to spend a few hours. Uh, in terms of cost, I mean, it's, you know, you can buy a kayak now at your local Ace Hardware store. You can buy a kayak at Walmart. Um, so you don't necessarily have to go out and buy the, the top high end stuff, but yeah, you're going to spend, you know, three to $500 probably if you want to buy kind of entry level recreational uh, kayak. There, there are some kayak programs that are set up where you could, you could uh, through REI and a number of other stores that offer kayak trainings. I'm sure there, there's some clubs that, that do that as well. Um, and I, I need to check into it. I'm not sure if um, if Parks and Wildlife offers some some paddling trainings. I know we have some some boater education, boater safety trainings, and I'm pretty sure we offer some kayak. Uh, kayaking classes, and then we've got um, some some programs that are set up through our state parks division to kind of help people get their feet wet, exposed to um, camping and and hiking and outdoor recreation opportunities. So there may be some some paddling education type courses there as well. But um, but yeah, I mean, you just need to you get online and start start shopping and um, look around and see how much you want to invest. Because yeah, you could. You could spend a few hundred or a few thousand on something like that. It just kind of depends on what your <laughs> your interest and, and preference is. Great. All right, Tim, thank you for your time, your insight. We've got a tremendous amount of uh, uh, comments in, in the comments feed here of, of what a informative and excellent pictures, by the way. Uh, I'll give you some photographer credit there. Uh, probably most of those were from you. So. Anyway, we, we thank you for joining the Austin Woods and Waters Club here today. And uh, we'll have, we're going to have a, a couple of river fishing trips since I'm heading up the fishing uh, aspects of, uh, for the club here. And uh, we invite you to, you and your boys, to come join us or your wife or whoever and uh, have a, a, a day on the river somewhere. So we'd love to have you uh, join us on those trips there. So we'll reach out to you and see if you might be available to do so. But Thank you again, Tim, and uh, uh, we'll be back in touch and great presentation. Uh, so as we oh, wind down, you. yep, you bet. And as we wind down here, I just remember uh, what want to ask you all as um, club members to hit join and pay your dues uh, for 2021. And if you're not a club member, we'd love to, to have you uh, join as well. And, and so go to the Austin Woods and Waters uh, uh, page AustinWoodandWaters.org is our website and hit the join in. I think there's a link in the comments section here. Uh, this will be on our Facebook page and YouTube uh, channels here uh, for a good while. So um, 
anyway, if you want to look back at it again or share this video with uh, to some of your friends, uh, let them know about the club. That'd be great. Thanks so much. And uh, y'all have a good day uh, and good 2021.